Okay, we're ready, right? We can start? Yes? Is CMN TV ready, Matt? I believe they are. Okay. Then I'm gonna go ahead and call um, to order the regular meeting of the Berkeley Planning Commission on Tuesday, April 27th. In accordance with adopted legislation in the current state of emergency, this meeting is being conducted virtually via Zoom. Would everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, to the Republic. For which, it, for which stands, it stands, one nation, one nation under, under God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Okay, Aaron, could you please call the roll? Commissioner Bardis. Here, Berkeley, Michigan. Commissioner Dolan. Here, Berkeley, Michigan. Commissioner Kempner. Here, Berkeley, Michigan. Commissioner Patterson. Here, Berkeley, Michigan. Commissioner Richardson. Oh, you're on mute, Mark. Present. Berkeley, Berkeley Michigan. Michigan. Uh, Commissioner Smith. Uh, here in Berkeley. Commissioner Stern. Here, I'm actually in Beverly Hills, Michigan. Commissioner Trotto. Here in Berkeley, Michigan. Chair Kapolinski. Here in Berkeley, Michigan. Okay, that brings us to the approval of the agenda. Does anyone have any modifications or motions to approve? Motion to approve. A second. Aaron, could you call the roll? Dolan? Yes. Kempner? Yes. Patterson? Yes. Richardson? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. 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 <laughs> Mark, it seems like you're you're here in two different settings. Could you? Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting rid of those. Okay. Gonna mute that one. Unmute this one. See if that works. I apologize. Uh, Smith. Yes. Stern. Yes. Trotto. Yes. Bardis. Yes. Kapolanski. Yes. All right, the minutes from March 23rd, um, that was our regular meeting. Does anyone have any changes or additions to those? Um, I do. I think I missed that one because I had COVID, but I'm listed as present. Well, we're glad you're feeling better, Julie. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> any other changes? Motion to approve. For it. Aaron, could you call the roll? Kempner? Yes. Patterson? Yes. Richardson? Yes. 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 Stern? Yes. Prado? Yes. Artis? Yes. Dallin? Yes. Kapolanski? Yes. We also have minutes from the April 6th work session. Any changes to those? Or motions to approve? I think I was at that one and I'm listed. I'm not on those minutes. Okay. My apologies. I it's all right. <laughs> okay, was there a motion? Um, a motion and a second with the change that Julie's added to that one. 
Uh, motion with Julie's changes. Approve. Second. Could you call the roll, Aaron, please? Patterson? Yes. Richardson? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. I'm going to leave and get back on. Smith? Yes. Stern? Yes. Trotto? Yes. Artis? Yes. Dowen? Yes. Kempner? Yes. Kapolanski? Yes. Any communications tonight? Um, the only communication we had is uh, late this afternoon, I received an email uh, memo from Jennifer Finney, the DDA director, uh, in relation to one of the items that we will be discussing, the expanded uses in the downtown district. Okay, so I, assume, I assume we'll touch on that then. Yes. Okay. All right, then I'll move on to citizen comment. If any members of the public wish to speak during the appropriate agenda item, we ask that you please use the raise your hand feature or dial star nine if you've called in. Comments can also be submitted to planning at berkeleymish.net. Just a reminder that the Planning Commission will not engage you in any discussion. We ask you to keep your comments to three minutes or less um, and to also state your name and address. Is there anyone who would like to comment? I don't think I see anyone, correct? And we haven't received any emails either. Okay, then I will close citizen comment and move on to the CIP. Uh, thank you. Um, this item comes to you again from the city manager's office. Uh, this was uh, reviewed uh, in draft form at the March meeting and as uh, per our standard procedure is brought before you again um, for your motion to recommend to city council. Uh, city manager uh, Matt Baumgarten is here to, to go over it and to go through his presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, instead of doing a uh, line by line analysis as we did in March, I uh, prepared a slideshow presentation that covers much of the same topic areas, but groups them a little bit differently, uh, puts context behind this plan and uh, actually helps us highlight the, the good work that we're doing with the investments in the capital improvements plan. So um, here we go. Uh, first, a little bit of background for those that are uh, unfamiliar with this particular type of planning. Uh, in general, a capital improvements plan is a, a plan by which a community uh, lays out the next several years as far as how they look to invest uh, in their different uh, capital facilities, whether that be, um, uh, in our case, it, it's a lot of, it's some vehicles, it is some of our parks, it's some of our facilities, uh, roads, sidewalks, uh, any of the big hard concrete, uh, not actual car, not literally concrete, but um, uh, physical tactile items that we invest in. Uh, this does have a counterpart plan called the uh, Capital Equipment Replacement Plan, uh, which the city has maintained for, for many years now. It also helps us plan out um, replacements of existing equipment. So in that situation, uh, a truck that we've had for a long time, an initial purchase would show up on this document. Uh, replacement of that vehicle would show up on our CERP, our equipment replacement plan. So uh, the city does, so uh, I, I say that to say that this is not all of the investments we make in the community, um, but this certainly helps us guide uh, the, the spending and look long-term on the capital investments that we make within the community. Uh, we'll try my best not to do a, a line, uh, a word for word on this, but I fall back into my old teaching habits sometimes and uh, do end up just reading text on page. So I apologize if I, uh, if I do that. Uh, what I've also outlined here is the approval process by which we follow to adopt this. Uh, you'll see step one through six have already happened, uh, including the most recent step that involved this uh, body, which was our March meeting uh, where we reviewed the document itself. Uh, as the arrow indicates, we find ourselves here at step seven. Uh, step seven is when the planning commission reviews this, makes the first of two approvals, and then a recommendation uh, that the council fund the items outlined in the document uh, uh, you have in your attached packet here. So uh, steps seven and eight, uh, of course, will follow um, uh, immediately after this. 
uh, should the Planning Commission uh, approve and recommend. Um, this has been incorporated into a draft agenda, which will be reviewed by the City Council. They also do a line by line like we did here in March, uh, but of the entire budget during a work session in May, uh, that is the 11th and 12th. And then finally, it will come before them per, uh, per the charter on the third Monday of the month, uh, which in this case is May 17th. Uh, yeah, May 17th. Uh, so that is where they will actually adopt not only this document, but also set rates, set, uh, set millage rates, water rates, and adapt the uh, operating budget itself. Uh, so a little summary here, uh, the CIP, Berkeley specific CIP uh, uh, helps us plan all the way through the far flung future of June 30th, 2028. Uh, that is the next seven fiscal years included here. We've done a great job uh, over the last three years of, of adding to this. We initially started off with a five year plan, uh, then it grew to six and then finally seven. Uh, so obviously next year uh, we'll actually be looking at the 22-23 uh, as a near term. And then we will add the 28-29 budget. So we will forever be looking seven years in the future and try to predict as many items as we possibly can uh, so that we have some, and that's the way that we turn our plans into actual actions. So we're excited about that. Uh, again, assessed annually. Not all departments you'll notice here have capital needs, but in this particular year, uh, we've got capital uh, needs for the recreation department, library, uh, public Works, Public Safety, and the Downtown uh, Development Authority. You'll notice that the municipal building is also listed here. Um, this is sort of a catch-all as we discussed last month. Uh, not only does this cover improvements to City Hall itself, but also general citywide improvements that don't have necessarily a single department to call home. Uh, you'll see this includes, um, uh, in a little bit, you'll see this includes uh, wayfinding and some parking lot improvements that we have uh, built into this plan. So for a little bit of context, you'll see uh, contrasting the near term to the to the long term. So the, the one graph in front of you here has um, sort of a breakdown of what departments have the largest capital needs. Probably not surprising given the amount of infrastructure that they handle. Your public works department, both in the near term and the long term, are the most to resemble Pac-Man here. Um, just a purple version, if you will. Uh, so they are by far our largest generator of capital needs because the city has many roads uh, or many miles of road, many miles of sidewalk, uh, water main, sewer main. It all falls under um, the, the good care of our Department of Public Works. Um, they have no small task when they're creating their budgets and their long term plans. All right, some of the highlights, some of the things that we're particularly proud of uh, in this one. Um, when it, um, if you'll pardon Madam Chair, the, the moment, a couple of slides worth of bragging. We're pretty excited about uh, sustained infrastructure or uh, sustained infrastructure investments. That's really what the highlight portions here are going to center around, uh, particularly in road investments. Thanks to Berkeley voters, uh, we'll have 1.1, a little bit over $1.1 million annually devoted to roads, uh, specifically from our infrastructure fund. And that is the, uh, that is a fund that was approved by Berkeley voters in 2018. Um, so we're excited about that. Also, we've got some state funds that we dedicated to the city roads as well from our major and local road fund. Again, that's a state allocation that uh, um, fill, refills those coffers each year. Um, and then also uh, we have $170,000 annually dedicated to spray patching, crack sealing and overbanding. Um, spray patching for, I think most of our probably familiar by this point, uh, but for any of the millions watching at home, uh, spray patch is a actual, as it sounds, it's a spray emulsion that actually gets jetted into potholes and creates its own um, patch. And so it's, we like it more than say just your cold patch, which we use on a temporary basis, uh, but often comes back out. The, um, the spray patch uh, is heated and cools within that hole and stays and is far more durable. Crack sealing is, is unsurprisingly exactly what it sounds like and overbanding is something that we do in conjunction with crack sealing and, and that helps hold hold our asphalt roads together both uh both um uh, spray patch and overbanding tend to work best on our asphalt streets uh, again contrasting the um annual budget the annual um contribution and then uh also making sure to note the total over the course of of the entire uh plan here so 
Um, really excited about the amount of investment we're making. It's almost $10 million worth of roads in just seven years. Uh, Want to also give a nod, uh, we're in the midst of a Berkeley citywide sidewalk replacement cycle. Um, so we're also making some good investments in the city sidewalks as well. And you'll see there's um, uh, the red sections are the ones that we plan to do this year. Not only are we doing two new sections, uh, sort of the, the from north to south, you look at the middle areas there, uh, but you'll see an area that's listed as 20 and 21. We're actually going back and uh, redoing or, or catching some of the ones that have moved a little bit or have uh, become dangerous or ne in need of immediate um, effect in the, uh, the section that we've already done. So, and then we see in 2022, we'll be looking at the, basically the two corners there uh, and doing each of those. One of the reasons why we held off is that actually uh, we're not the only ones that investing in our infrastructure. Consumers, uh, energy will be doing some work all along the, uh, the section between 12 and Webster uh, from Coolidge to Greenfield. So that's gonna involve quite a bit of sidewalk work on their part as they replace uh, gas mains and gas leads into individual homes. So we'll be working in conjunction with one another. It's nice when we can plan ahead. Uh, it's nice when they do the same and we have an opportunity to align those plans to make sure that we're not being redundant. Uh, another benefit of a long-term planning process that we go and undergo each year. Uh, looking at, of course, our uh, water and sewer investment as well. This, again, is another substantial investment over the course of seven years. Uh, you'll see that we have plans for an, a sustained annual investment throughout the course of the CIP at about $1.6 million. Uh, breaking this down a little bit further, that includes uh, water main replacement. That includes, um, yeah, water main investment. We've got a large project set for this upcoming year at about $1.8 million. Uh, but then even at even each subsequent year, we're looking at a, uh, just over half a million dollars in additional replacement work. Uh, part of that is going to include $400,000 um, lead and service line removals. This is, uh, we're working in conjunction with the state. Uh, this is one of our least favorite terms, an unfunded mandate. This came down to us a couple of years ago. Uh, we've been working with the state. The state's been sort of updating and, and changing its, its standards and what its desired goals are for this project. But uh, we recently got what we think is the final word on what the state's expectations are. And us here locally, it's gonna be about a $400,000 annual investment in our city sewer lines. Again, this is, all, um, this is all to make sure that people have a high level of trust that their drinking water is safe. In Berkeley, we, have, we test each year and we continually show that that is the case, uh, but this is gonna add uh, an additional peace of mind for our residents. Uh, likewise, uh, another investment that we're making in our water and sewer program is uh, we're, we're going to be relining, uh, well, continue to reline about a mile of our combined sewer each year. So the structural relining that we do actually builds a brand new high density plastic line within the existing line that we have. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a way to replace the line without having to uh, break the surface at all. So we don't dig up, we don't have to pull roads, sidewalks, street out. Uh, and it just slides right inside the existing line, creates a brand new durable material that is supposed to have a useful life of about 100 years or so. Uh, so again, we've got about 30% of our system lined at this point, and we continue to add about another one to 2% a year uh, by doing about a mile's worth of actual piping a year. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, we've got about a 25 to $40,000 investment in our asset management program. The city uh, for the last half decade or so has been utilizing GS, GIS software to, um, to basically create a comprehensive map of all the uh, infrastructure we have in the city. So that includes water main, sewer main. Uh, recently it includes all the street signs in the city. It includes the road conditions, sidewalk conditions, locations of trees. Uh, it's all put into the same uh, GIS uh, system. And then we use that to plot out um, and really pinpoint uh, infrastructure needs and make our resources go as far as possible. Uh, not only is our DPW uh, really embraced the use of GIS, but um, Erin Schluto is, is herself an expert of this. Um, she's, she's used this system for a long time and has added quite a bit of expertise to our team and her time being here uh, with utilizing this program. Her and, or Aaron and Derek actually jointly presented um, at a 
uh, conference last year on the Berkeley way of utilizing GIS and the, the benefits that it's had here. So not only are we impressed with the two of them here locally, uh, but they have been um, they have been asked to speak at the state level as well on, on how good of a job we're doing using this. So it certainly warrants a sustained investment. Uh, next, high, next item that I want to highlight here is our investment in the parks and the, the, the quality of life that comes along with living in Berkeley. Uh, we have in our plan here uh, about a $2.3 million investment in our parks. Uh, this one goes through, you'll notice in this, uh, the CIP, this only goes through 2025. That, um, that program aligns with our recently adopted five-year parks plan. Uh, it was adopted by council in December of last year. Uh, it takes us through five years of uh, investment and improvements in the city's park facilities and, and really all things recreation. Um, so uh, we're excited about that. Uh, we, we really feel that we have a mandate from the people that participated in this. We Just like with the master planning process, we, we did a number of surveys, communication events, informational events, all to uh, really get to the crux of what people are looking for in their parks. And we're uh, excited that this plan um, funds that. We're actually in the, the second fiscal year uh, of attacking this. And so, uh, as you'll see, uh, we really take this, uh, this plan seriously. We really have taken the mandate from the community seriously uh, in the level of investment we plan to make. Uh, again, this is, and this didn't come out of the blue. Uh, we have maintained a five-year parks plan for many years now. Uh, this one uh, does great work in building off of our previous one, which was uh, 2016 through the 2020 plan. Um, so might as well uh, start there. I think on your sheet included in your packet, uh, the CIP, uh, I'm going to try to follow the same departmental order that this one does. Um, so this, that one starts with the Parks and Recreation Department. We'll do the same here. Uh, you'll see the uh, about 350,000 over the course of the next five years is dedicated to Oxford Merchant Parks. But again, noting that uh, we currently are in the midst of a renaming contest. The community uh, has submitted a couple of great um, uh, 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 potential names for that area. We look to, uh, in combining the, those two properties, we also need a brand new name that reflects the, the community and the excitement we have around this investment here. Uh, so you'll see the breakout here, the additional play equipment, the seating, picnic tables, and shades. Uh, also the additional park pavilion and uh, parking around the perimeter of that park as well. Uh, we got into a little bit of a conversation last time. Uh, we did have to break this project up across a couple of different fiscal years in order to make the full investment uh, to get it to where we want it to go. So um, we've, the last two fiscal years we've been working on this. Uh, we do see the next two fiscal years as well. Uh, one of the things that we really wanted to do was, um, again, create a nice shady place for all people. Uh, pe people think of parks as just for kids. Uh, that's certainly not going to be the case with this one. Uh, so additional parking, pavilion areas, shady spots. Uh, it's not on this plan, but uh, the park will have Wi-Fi. So we'll have opportunities for people to go and sit and have a nice place to, to work. Uh, and there's also going to be a pavilion in this one like we have in JC Park. Uh, although that is, we're going to give the year the park sort of a year to um, figure out what a, a normal level of, of traffic is uh, before we end up adding that brand new function in the pavilion. But that will be rentable like the uh, JC one is. So um, marketing your calendars now to hold uh, kids, grandkids, best friends, roommates, kids, um, whoever needs to post a party out of there, uh, the pavilion will be ready after uh, not this fiscal year, but the next. We also see uh, moving down to Angel Park. We see this is a park that we jointly um, maintain with the school district. Uh, so on our side, we'll have investments in the ball field surface. We have to make those every couple of years. Also, there's some fence repairs that are needed there. Anybody that, um, that has kids or has gone to play at that park, you'll notice that the fence needs to be replaced. And then also uh, in fiscal year 24, 25, those, base, those tennis courts are uh, owned and maintained by the city. And as you see, we'll put pretty substantial investment in making sure that those remain top notch. So about $100,000 into refurbishing those tennis courts there. We've seen a boom of tennis uh, in the last couple of years. It's really, uh, all of our tennis courts have seen increased use. Uh, it was one thing that came through very clearly in the uh, five-year recreation master plan. So not only here, but you'll see an investment in each of our tennis courts as we go through the, the recreation section here. 
Uh, Lazenby is next to Rogers Elementary. It's, uh, we'll have some drainage work happening. I apologize, I didn't add the year there, but I believe it's uh, in 2324. Um, this, I only, I'm working off one screen here, so I can't toggle back and forth, but uh, that'll be a real improvement. Lazenby is largely uh, used for baseball functions. So there's a, there's a large outfield there. Um, so anybody who plays uh, center, right, or left field will not have to worry about wet shoes anymore after, uh, after we had some drainage there. All right, last, or, uh, next, moving on here, uh, about $100,000 for Friends Park, which was named in honor of the uh, Friends of Berkeley Parks and Recreation. It was formerly Oxford Towers Park. In fact, I believe it's still listed in your CIP that way. Um, but Friends Park will see likewise a, an investment in the tennis courts for repair or replacement in the upcoming fiscal year. Also adding some adult exercise equipment. Um, the, one of the reasons why, how, one of the ways it got its old name was it is fairly close to um, Oxford Towers. And so uh, we see those residents when they get out and uh, start moving around, it's within walking distance. So we're excited about the, um, the opportunity to add some some useful items to that park for the people that use it the most. Uh, moving on to JC Park, which uh, is our uh, second largest park now that we've combined uh, merchants and Oxford. We'll see nearly a million dollars of investment there over the next five years. We're very proud of that number. Um, so we'll have, this includes everything from uh, engineering for future improvements to new playground equipment, uh, updating our accessible pads to make sure they're at the standards that the ADA require. Uh, also updating the pavilion there, uh, installing a bathroom, which uh, we've utilized porta johns there for the last several years, uh, which are nice, but they're not, um, uh, they're not just not, have, not the same options as having an actual bathroom in place there. Um, and then again for, and then we also put an item in there for any additional engineering should it be needed. Uh, again, we, there's uh, any number of things that we wanna tackle there to make improvements, but it really is a, a great park. Um, uh, Bacon, I know a lot of the long timers uh, call it Bacon Park. Uh, we're actually in the conversation right now of maybe uh, returning to the days of yore and um, going back to officially uh, referring to that as, as Bacon Park again, because it is on Bacon Road. All right, uh, Community Park. Uh, community Park is also a large park. It goes all the way from the um, parking or the tennis courts that you see right on Catalpa at Robina all the way down and encompasses three different baseball fields. Uh, so it's a large, large park for us. Um, so that's, again, you'll see that's one of the reasons why this number is as large as it is. So over the course of the next five years, it's a, a, just over a half a million dollar investment in those parks as well. And that includes new playground equipment. Uh, again, the theme of tennis courts, that is our largest bundling of tennis courts. They're also our most popular. Uh, the high school, in fact, even this evening, I was uh, just at community park coaching my kids soccer team and um, so all three tennis courts are actually there's six tennis courts there. They're all in use right now. Um, there is a the U.S. Soccer U.S. Uh, tennis Association. I probably have that acronym wrong, uh, but they host tournaments out of there. Our uh, Anderson and the high school both uh, utilize their those courts for their uh, school teams. Uh, so we work with the school district very closely on those improvements to landscaping. Uh, likewise, updating the accessible pathways that run through there. And then also looking at a LED conversion for the lighting in um, the, the fifth and final year of the five-year master plan. So again, these are the kind of investments that will have a return on investment over time. Last but not least, another jointly um, joint um, park with the school district at Pattengill, uh, much like you saw with the rest of them, we have a, um, some monies for the baseball field surface material and then fence repair as well. That'll be in the 23-24 the budget year. Community center itself, um, not a whole lot of investment. Obviously, uh, we, we still hold out hope that we can um, do something wholly different at that location. Uh, but near term, we do need to dedicate uh, about $5,000 for parking lot improvements. And then um, should we still be operating out of that building in the 24-25 um, fiscal year? Uh, we will have to make some investments in for wall repairs uh, because of the we have some foundational issues in that building, uh, mostly because of the way it was built and the, the fact that it's lasted so much uh, longer than its uh, its planned life. Uh, we do see some separation in the wall in the east and south walls that will need to be remedied. 
Um, that will be about a $35,000 investment. And um, so again, it's even keeping what we have is not, um, is becoming difficult for that particular facility. And last but not least, uh, for Parks and Rec, a potential $100,000 investment into our downtown area in conjunction with the DDA. Um, part of what the part of the feedback that the department has uh, received so far is they'd like to see some sort of downtown pocket park. Uh, we have tentatively looked at uh, Dorothea as a potential location for that, if you can envision it. It's along Coolidge in between uh, Coolidge and the uh, high school's practice field. Um, so think of Camelot Cleaners, think of Sugar Kisses. Those are the two businesses that are on either side. The city has some public parking uh, along that stretch as well. It's, it's not a long piece of um, property. It, it's fairly contained. It's not often used. Uh, we think it might be a, a good potential location for a uh, downtown pocket park. I believe that wraps up Parks and Rec. Uh, next on your sheet is the library. Uh, the library isn't a huge driver of capital expenses, um, but there are some investments that are needed there. Uh, in total, it's about, um, about $548,000 over the course of the capital plan here. Uh, so a little bit just over about a million or half a million dollars or so. Uh, maintenance items, not surprisingly, we, you know, we need to paint on a regular rotation. So interior and exterior painting is uh, included in the 21 and 21, uh, 22, and then six years later in the 27, 28 fiscal years. And then reupholster of um, furn library furniture is next year. Upcoming items, uh, updates for carpet for our interiors. Uh, one of the things that the next item is one that we're really excited about, the uh, library staff, as well as the library board, have been uh, talking about the potential for individualized study rooms. So um, most obviously you go to the library, you gotta be very quiet, uh, but if you're working with a partner or a study buddy, uh, then you're gonna need to converse at least at some level of volume. These would be the answer to that. You'd be able to go inside these rooms, close the door, and then you and whomever you're working with will be able to collaborate on projects or study together. Uh, we think even Post COVID, uh, these will be a popular item because people it be help with, people can close themselves off. And um, if you're typically uh, a home worker now at this point, you don't go in the office anymore. This would be an opportunity for you to go um, get out of the house, maybe take a meeting. Um, it has any number of fantastic uses. So we're excited. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't do it this year, but excited to get that moving next year. Uh, this could also be considered a maintenance item, but we, we need to redo our HVAC system. Uh, and then we've got some parking lot repairs as well. Next up, the municipal building, as I mentioned, it's sort of a coverall for us. Uh, specifically, city hall projects include uh, about $300,000 for uh, interior reconfiguration of our workspaces. Um, our city hall, the, really the layout has not changed in several decades. But the type of work and the way that we the way that we work has changed a great deal. Um, so we're getting to the point where the the physical layout of the interior of our city hall just does not yield uh, as efficient works uh, ability as as we we would like. Uh, we do have some monies in a in a building fund that was dedicated to for improvements to city hall as well as the uh, former district court location, the 45A. Uh, so we'll be utilizing those funds. It's not. Uh, a general funds expense per se, because it has offsetting revenues from that account. So uh, we, we hope, again, we hope we make good use of this. There's some security improvements we wanna make. Uh, we're really in just the early planning stages for this though. So we don't have a whole lot of, uh, we, we've got a lot of the goals, but we don't have a whole lot of the physical plans drawn up as of yet. Uh, more broadly, uh, as far as citywide projects, uh, we have a, uh, in partnership with the DDA, we're likewise investing in the wayfinding around the community. Um, you can still see a lot of these older signs. Uh, most of the time they're brown, either by the colors that were selected or the fact that it's just rusted to that point. Um, but either way, we're trying to get away from the brown and get something more vibrant, something more updated, certainly something eye-catching and um, very useful signage that will help people navigate their way around the community. Uh, the last portion of this is $500,000. We actually pushed this and uh, we had this for this year uh, when we discussed this in March. But as I mentioned then, uh, this is one of the things that we would be um, potentially having to push back to a subsequent fiscal year. And that it did end up happening in the course of our budget conversation. So uh, we're looking at uh, next fiscal year, not this, not the upcoming one, but the one thereafter, 22-23. 
um, having a, uh, a brand new parking lot in the West 12 mile area that will, um, we see these as economic development tools. The, the better, the, the more publicly provided parking you have in an area, the better use private property owners can make of their parcel. Uh, they don't have to dedicate as much to um, parking spots. They can really fill out their parcel with as much building as the zoning code will allow. So we're looking forward to that and the commercial areas through there. Uh, moving down, public works, like I said, by far the largest. Um, and, and, and the CIP here, it's to the tune of about $26 million, uh, nearly $27 million. Uh, again, trying to stay away from reading slide to slide, uh, but you'll see the investments we want to make in our sidewalk improvements. But not only is that, uh, not only is that through special assessments where we partner with cost sharing on our, with our residents, uh, but we're also making investments in the sidewalk ramps, making sure those are ADA compliant. Uh, but also making a, a substan substantial investment in a new walking path that will connect 12 Mile to Webster along Coolidge. Um, those that are frequently runner runners or travel that area know that we currently have a path there. It's asphalt, it's very close to the fence line. Sometimes uh, the overgrowth along that fence line actually prevents you from using that sidewalk. Um, we're gonna pull it back from the fence, broaden it, uh, probably utilize uh, concrete, and make it a nice, very pleasant walk that will you know, connect our residents to Rory Oak and then into the 13 Woodward development as well. So very excited to see that come to fruition. Um, next up, our DPW yard and offices, like I mentioned with City Hall. Um, this is a situation again where the way we work and the area that we work in don't align as well as they used to. Um, so we, over the you see over the entire plan, we've got um, hitting this project bit by bit, uh, looking to make um, about a $1.5 million investment in our DPW offices and yard. Uh, not only does the, the, everything from the salt dome to, the, to where we stash our, our gravel and building materials need to be re reorganized, but also the physical workspace that um, our team there works out of needs to be redone as well. So we're going to be repurposing an existing building. We won't be building new on that site, uh, but we have a space that we'll be renovating into the new DPW offices. They'll include um, a space for our staff, uh, an updated break room, updated locker rooms, updated shower facilities, um, a more welcoming entrance and workspace for, for visitors there, but also our employees that, that stay there each day. Um, some updated conference area with some new technology interface um, that we just aren't able to do in our existing building. Um, uh, good, let's say uh, this is going to be positive all the way around. It's that that uh, group does a ton of work, and they have done so in um, some some aged facilities. And excited to make some changes there for them for that uh, department. Uh, moving on to public safety, uh, this is again uh, another group that is in a, their building is not as old, but um, we don't want to see it age beyond its years. So we're looking to make investments into the HVAC system. The current boiler is original to the building, which was completed in 1988. Um, it's not a very efficient system. It was good for its day, but technology has certainly improved. Uh, so we're going from about something in the mid 70s as far as uh, energy efficiency to something in the high 90s for energy efficiency. So we see this as a, as a savings long-term. Uh, we need to get into really the nuts and bolts of it to find out what it is. But in our initial conversations with our uh, preventative maintenance um, HVAC contractor, they've talked about the savings that this has the potential to yield. So absolutely excited about that. Um, and then another $15,000 in security updates. Uh, again, you see some of the examples listed here. Uh, this is in conjunction with the lobby project that's happening this fiscal year. Um, so it'll be the lobby of be far more welcoming, far more safe. We'll be able to control the access uh, a lot better than we do now. Um, so it's, again, uh, we, we see nothing but positives coming out of this for sure. Uh, moving on, communications and infrastructure is also being updated. This is something that we will forever be investing in. Uh, as soon as we get a radio system in place, um, you know, it's time to start planning for the next one, one that will do a little bit better. So uh, we got radio antenna updates that'll help us for long-term communication that'll reach all the way out to Woodward, 
all the way up and down 12 miles. So again, we, we continue to, we are typically a hub for the law enforcement agencies during Dream Cruise and uh, to a lesser extent, Cruise Fest. Uh, again, this just makes us that much more attractive as a hub for law enforcement for, for managing these large events. Uh, and again, some of the radio system equipment that's happening here as well. Um, so it's again, about a $15,000 investment there. Uh, next up, uh, some officer and, uh, amenities and wellness. This includes, uh, again, security upgrades for our, pro for our door system. Uh, that was something that was in, when we discussed in March, that was in the next budget year. It has since moved to the 23 or 22, 23 budget year. Uh, $100,000 investment in the basement area. Hopefully none of you have, have found yourselves in the basement of public safety, but it's typically been a records room. Uh, our shooting range is down there. There's a lot of space, but not a lot of useful space for us. Um, and in order to free up some areas in our upper floors, we're going to move some of the functions we have downstairs, including our recreation facilities, uh, wellness centers, um, weight, weightlifting areas, um, things like that that keep that we keep our officers um, healthy, safe in the building, and ready to go in a moment's notice. Um, likewise, locker room investments as well for our male and our female officers. Last but not least, also uh, keeping our vehicles safe and and long um, and, and better working condition for longer, uh, we would like to install a carport along the um, would that be the west side of the building that uh, you see where our vehicles are parked now. We would have uh, an overhang there that would shield them from the weather, the rain, the snow, um, and we we hope this makes um, uh, an eventual switch to hybrid and electric vehicles possible as well. All right, last department to, to cover here, um, uh, our downtown development authority, again, not a large capital uh, department for us, not a large capital fund. Uh, so you see it's about $360,000 over the course of the CIP. Uh, a portion of that is to continuing the uh, phase two of our uh, wayfinding project, again, in conjunction with the city. Uh, streetscape, you'll see an annual investment of about $30,000 into things like, um, benches and trash cans those are two of the ones that we're, we're discussing now but also hopefully eventually uh, our poles our signage things like that anywhere where you see some rust some wear um, peeling paint chip paints uh, uh, this sustained investment is working really hard to make all of that a thing of the past so you see nothing but the beautiful stores and attractive places to dine and shop and entertain yourselves in Berkeley so we don't have any uh, we don't have any of those little distractions along the way. This upcoming fiscal year, um, the West 12 section, which we consider to be Tyler all the way to Greenfield, uh, we have an additional allotment for improvements in that area. Um, it's, it's an area that hasn't had a lot of investment. Uh, I think most of the businesses along there will tell you that. Uh, so we additional planters, benches, streetscape materials, uh, really make sure that, that anybody who walks up and down that section of the city knows that this is also a favorite of ours. This is also our downtown. And it's also full of businesses that we're incredibly proud to call uh, Berkeley's own. So um, we're, we're, again, there's a subcommittee that was formed at the DDA uh, headed up by uh, Brian Zifkin of Zaleman's Treasures. He's working with area businesses on what they wanna see for investment. And the, the DDA was more than happy to, to facilitate some of those things. Uh, and finally, the, uh, uh, there's a plaza project. We've been discussing this now for a couple of years. The school district has been kind enough to dedicate a section of land uh, that formerly had a house and business on it into a plaza along Coolidge. Um, this would be, uh, right now it's sort of just an open space right now, but this is in place of where the, sort of where the community garden used to be as well. Uh, in partnership uh, with the school district and the city, the DDA has, uh, has budgeted for a $60,000 investment into that plaza. We're still working through the planning phase. We had to sort of go back to the drawing board and what we'd hoped for uh, in a previous set of plans. It just, it, it ended up being far more expensive than we were able to do. Um, but there is a, again, a subcommittee working there, uh, working very hard and um, it'll be a nice collaboration between those three entities. Uh, and finally, just again, trying to add some additional context. Uh, you see each of the years, uh, the, the level of investment. Uh, it's not uncommon for the near term ones to be a little bit higher than the farther ones out. Um, that's as we get a better 
uh, idea of what may not last as long as we had once hoped. Um, sometimes you see those um, earlier, the near the bars are being the higher ones. Uh, but again, there's a lot of planning that goes into this and, and we tend to find it to be a useful tool. Uh, at the March meeting, I talked about trying to find some previous years, uh, what those investments were to sort of see how the trend goes. And what I found was there wasn't really a, uh, a trend there to be had. If you look just at the fiscal year that we're in right now, you'll see that's, um, that that first bar is twice as high because of uh, we we purchased the uh, the fire truck, the new fire truck, the new ladder truck for public safety, as well as the um, the investments that we've made at Merchant Oxford Park. So um, again, these trends just go up and down, up and down, up and down. So uh, hopefully this is useful in setting some of the context, uh, and hopefully this is a little bit better than trying to read numbers off a tiny screen. Um, for uh, asking the Planning Commission's consideration and approval this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Matt. Um, so we had the chance, first of all, is this a public hearing, Aaron? I didn't see that. I wasn't sure if we had to have one. Okay. Okay. Um, so we had the opportunity, obviously, at our last meeting to ask a lot of our initial questions on this. I don't think too much has changed. Um, does anyone have any questions on the capital improvement plan? I have a question. Sure. On the road repairs, do you have a map showing what has been repaired and what is planning to be repaired? I know they have a list of roads, but uh, and when they're planning on being done. Yeah, so we uh, we have on the city's website, we set up a, a whole tab for infrastructure projects. And there's a map on there that has, it's the city with a bunch of little yellow dots. Uh, that is the 183 separate locations that uh, we're doing uh, this year and last, between last year and this year. Uh, you, I, I believe last time I looked at it, it was um, sort of shaded red and blue like we did with the sidewalk project. It seemed to find that one. So, okay. Anything else? Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead, Mark. Where is the um, water main that's going to be replaced? We, uh, for actually, I don't have that answer for you this year. We're still in some of the planning phase there. We know the scope and we know the, the size at which we want to replace but I don't have the actual uh, location for you just yet. We're, we're finalizing that now. There is a map on here that shows the 2021 lining locations, but what shows what's already been replaced? As far as the sewer lines? Yes. The, I mean, I uh, see new locations, but I don't see what's already been done. You're right. I'm not sure that we've uh, generated that map in the past. That might be useful for folks that are just generally curious about it. Okay. Um, I hate to keep asking questions, but the walkway from 12 Mile to Webster. Uh, have you guys been in discussions at all with the cemetery about removing the fence line and possibly getting rid of most of the half cut down trees that are stuck in the fences? They, yeah, they have talked about it. It's privately owned the, um, I think two years ago now, I lose track with 2020 being such a dead year. Uh, we did meet with the new management uh, on that same topic. Mm -hmm. And so they, they have, to their credit, they're the ones that have done a better job of cutting back a lot of that overgrowth along there. And it is in their uh, long-term plan to replace that fence completely. Uh, but we still think it's best to just give it a buffer space, maybe two to three feet off that fence um, and um, and put our own path along there that, that really can't be bothered. But is the short answer is it's privately held. And yes, they do have that in their plans. Is there any talk of possibly removing the fence? No, they still want to keep the fence in place. They, uh, they're, they're not really open to removing um, any of the fences along there. They uh, like the controlled access that they have right now between the, um, the, the yard access as well as the, the grand entrance at 12 and Woodward. Uh, so they don't have, uh, in our conversation with them, they don't have any thoughts to, um, to remove that fence and just kind of have it be open space. I mean, the only reason I bring it up, it's kind of an ISO when you drive down with all the trees cut off halfway and dead in the fencing. So yeah. it'll be nice to have a walkway there, though. It's one of Marty's okay. ideas. Absolutely. Yeah. So I have another question. 
Uh, there, there are budget items for uh, drainage at most of the uh, playgrounds and parks. Um, is that is that in the, in the nature of, of maintenance and up, up, upkeep, or is that replacing uh, catch basins and um, um, you know um, uh, I, I forget the term, but the drains that go into the city drains. Yeah. So in both in the both the areas where you see it in this plan, it's uh, it's in this plan because it's a new installation. Okay. And is that likely to lead appreciably to increased uh, stormwater volume going into the city's uh, uh, drains? It would it would probably increase it. Yes, sir. Uh, we don't have um, uh, at least I have not seen a, a calculation on how much that would be yet. Okay. Thanks. I have a question. Um, is there a plan for moving over to electric vehicles? Like, are you looking to have the carport and then start swapping over? Or is it just kind of something that you're like, we know eventually we want to do, but we don't have a solid plan yet? More of the latter. Anyone, is there anyone that wants to speak from the public on this? Don't see any hands raised and I haven't received any emails. Okay. Additional questions or discussion from the commission? Do we need two motions on this or just one? As far as I knew, we just need one for the recommendation. Isn't that right, Matt? Recommendation uh, for approval? Yeah, and I think inherent to the recommendation would be an approval. So if there's no further discussion, does anyone have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll make a motion to uh, uh, recommend approval to city council with the capital improvement plan. Support. Okay, um, any other discussion? Aaron, could you call the roll please? Richardson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Stern? Yes. Trotto? Yes. Bardis? Yes. Dolan? Yes. Kempner? Yes. Patterson? Yes. Kapolanski? Yes. Okay, thank you so much, Matt, for coming and presenting that to us. Um, thanks. Thank you, my pleasure. Okay, um, so we have a couple discussion items. One is a continuation of a previous discussion, permitted uses in the downtown district, specifically entertainment uses. Um, do you wanna give us the intro on that, Aaron, please? Yes, uh, I'd like to reference my April 20th, 2020, 2021 review letter. Um, this comes, uh, returns to you from, uh, the beginning of our discussion last month, uh, which was born out of our uh, discussion from the previous month related to um, office uses on the first floor in the downtown district. Now, when we were looking at that, um, in addition to that, we were looking at other uses that we could potentially expand it to, i.e., you know, entertainment uses, uh, things of that nature. So I have included a number of things in, in this memo. First and foremost, uh, I gave you a list of all the principal permitted uses as well as the special land uses in the downtown district. Um, so that way you can get an idea of where we are right now with what we're allowed to have in, in, in that district. So by right, we're allowed to have, or permitted to have restaurants, bars and cocktail lounges, retail uses, um, dance studios, health clubs, food uses, movie theaters, et cetera. So we do have um, a few uses that do encapsulate some of the entertainment However, um, as I note a little bit further down, the, the nature of, of entertainment and, and people going out has changed a little bit. Um, people aren't just going to the movie theater or going to concerts exclusively. Now there's kind of um, a, a market for these entertainment group activities that are um, art or activity based. So painting with a twist, uh, art, Artisipate was discussed uh, last month as well as things like escape rooms or um, they have like these uh, uh, demolition uh, rooms as well. So um, 
in the downtown plan, I reference that um, the downtown district is located in what is designated as the downtown core character area. And as part of the zoning strategy for the downtown plan, it is suggested that a mix of independent retail, service, dining, and entertainment uses should be permitted. So this suggests to me that the, um, the intent of the downtown plan in this uh, traditional downtown core is to have people come, have dinner, go do an activity of some sort, um, and really spend the day, spend the night, spend the evening um, in, in downtown Berkeley. Now, our zoning ordinance does not have um, definitions specifically for uh, either commercial, uh, recreational, or entertainment. Now, one of the uses that is designated is the commercial recreation uses. And this gives uh, a list of examples, uh, bowling alleys, billiards, indoor archery, and other similar forms of indoor commercial recreation. So this is open to interpretation on whether or not something like painting with a twist, which is a sit down activity-based, uh, art-based type of activity, is that in the same line as an indoor archery range um, or a school of dance or indoor tennis courts? Um, so I did look through the, uh, the planner's dictionary for um, suggestions and definition language. Sometimes that can be a good, a good starting point when we're trying to um, figure out where things, things align. So I did include a definition for uh, recreation, commercial act, indoor activities as well as uh, entertainment for commercial indoor entertainment establishments. And these come from, from various places throughout our country. So these are um, adopted ordinance language um, that's already in existence elsewhere in, in the world. So it, it gives us a good base of, of how we want to go. Um, and like I said, you know, the, if we were to decide to go through this, you know, the, the visiting the, the movie theater or a concert are still very popular outings. Um, if we were to allow a themed or art-based creative entertainment activity use in the downtown district, um, it should be met with a similar use or, or something of that nature to encapsulate other uses that, that go along that same vein. Uh, I did look at some uh, comparable communities, uh, Ferndale and Madison Heights. I did look at, um, I was looking at places that had like painting with a twist or these kind of escape room zones. Um, there is one up in uh, Rochester Hills as well, uh, but theirs was a little bit complex because it's in the business district, but it's also as part of an overlay. And, and I didn't want to get uh, too far down, down into the weeds on that. So um, these are just two that are, are, are local and it, kind of shows how they regulate. Uh, Painting with a Twist is, is looked at as an art, music, craft studio. Um, and these are permitted in the, the CDBD, C2, C3, uh, MXD, MX2 districts. Um, Madison Heights, which has like an escape room activity based, that's considered an indoor, outdoor uh, recreational business. Um, so those are permitted in the B1, B2, B3. And I know that doesn't mean a lot. So I've included the, um, the zoning maps for each of these two communities, as well as for Berkeley. Um, so you can get an idea as to where, where they're located in the community and, and which corridors they're located on. So um, with that, the, the recommendation is to, to look at some of this language and look at these types of uses and see if that's something that we would like to include in the downtown district. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, you know, this would have to come along with a, a definition as well. Um, but the definition should include something along the lines of um, these type of uses included but not limited to. So that way it allows some flexibility with um, potential new business ventures that, um, that haven't been brought to Berkeley or haven't been invented yet. So that way we don't have to come back and continue having these discussions. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks. So we have a couple things that we need to um, get into here. I think the first is whether or not this would be a principal permitted use or a special land use. And then some of the more um, nuanced questions that Aaron asked about specific definitions and if we want to attach any additional parameters um, to a use like this. So what is everyone's initial thought on the special land use versus the principal permitted use? And if I may, are we still talking about just the entertainment portion stuff? Yes, okay. 
I, I don't see much difference between um, painting with a twist and something like a, a movie theater or comedy club. So I would I would gear more towards allowing that as a principal use. I agree with allowing it as a principal use. Same here. I, I think it's fine as a principal use. I think that's great. I would agree as well. Anyone who does it who objects to that? Okay, so we got the easy part done. <laughs> um, let's move into a little bit more of, of the details now. Who wants to start with that? So there was a whole bunch of options provided to us in terms of types of definitions and and how to distinguish things. Does anyone have a clear direction or thought on, on where they want to go with this? It might be a good jumping off point. So I just I just have a question. Can I ask it? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Great. Um, uh, what are some of the sources of information for uh, uh, determining that, you know, these are uh, recreational trends that we should be uh, accommodating? Uh, you know, what's the database that we're we're drawing from, uh, or what are the databases that we're we're getting this information from? Is it is it in the is it you know planning in the planning? community? Is this uh, something that these ideas are circulating or just where is this really uh, coming from, I guess, is my question. Are you talking about the types of you? I'm, I'm, I'm not yeah, sure. you, you had prefaced by saying, you know, we, we, uh, trends in recreation are changing. I'm just wondering where that, where you're getting that from. Is that is that planning uh, community uh, di uh, information or where's that coming from? It's yeah, just a question. Yeah, and, and that's just, it comes a lot from my own observations of the different uses that are coming up um, elsewhere in the community. So or not just our community, but other communities. So the painting with a twist, like I mentioned, has been become very popular. Um, the escape rooms have been very popular. There's um, the, the, the new one is a um, uh, like a smash room. You go in and you can take a sledgehammer and you start smashing things. And I've never been, but it looks amazing. Um, I'm so, <laughs> um, but those types of, you know, and, and those types of going to a place with a group of friends, doing an activity together, um, those types of, of uses, um, I've seen, you know, we've had inquiries here, here in our, our community with, uh, with new types of businesses that our, our ordinance just isn't quite, quite ready for. Um, it's, it's more geared towards the, the standard, you go out, you go to dinner and a movie and, and that's your evening. Um, but these types of things are, are becoming, I've got, I've received more and more inquiries about them in, in over the past year. I, I guess our definition should kind of revolve then around um, the idea of, of uh, communal uh, activities or um, group activities, uh, games, um, uh, you know, um, language like that, I think I'm just offering that as a kind of a starting point. And, and these can all be group activities. However, it's not exclusively. So, you know, I could go to an escape room myself and say, hey, I just want to go just for fun or go to a painting with a twist kind of thing just on a, on a regular. So it doesn't have to be a group group activity. Oh, well, it wouldn't be exclusive, um, you know, I, I'm yeah. just, uh, you'd include that include the word group, I think, to convey what you're offering or what's allowed. I, I guess that's my thought on it. A question that I want to throw out there. So I'm looking right now, the, 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 thing, the part that you referenced, Aaron, at the beginning under the entertainment uses heading where it talks about um, the list of permitted uses, commercial recreational centers, such as bowling alleys, billiard halls, indoor archery ranges, skating rinks, et cetera. Is that from our current ordinance, correct? That is, it's not in the definition section. It is in um, one of the, the district regulations of what's permitted in that, in that district, yes. And but that gets, is from our ordinance, yes. Okay, so this gets a little bit gray, but to me, um, 
an athletic or health club is a lot different than an escape room. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't necessarily think those two things should be grouped together. The part where it gets a little bit like a gray area is a bowling alley. You know, some might say that's a sport facility like an athletic or health club might be. And some might say it's more of a recreational facility. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to separate the two or not. What does everyone think of that? If I may? Yes, please. Yeah, so I included the commercial recreation uses here really as kind of like a, a this is what where things are allowed and this is how commercial recreation is grouped. So obviously this doesn't include the, the things we're talking about, like you said, the, the, the bowling alley and, and this does not align with an escape room or with a uh, uh, painting with a twist kind of thing. Um, so that's why, but I did include that because I, I wanted to make sure that, that we all knew that there was a space for commercial recreation and it was somehow uh, identified in our, in our ordinance, but I, I don't think that they necessarily align together. Okay. I have a question. So with the, with the entertainment, um, commercial recreation uses, would that then, um, since we all agreed it should be a principal permitted use in the downtown district, would that just be like bullet number 12 within the 138417? And then it's further defined? Is, is that kind of, is that is that the way it would lay out within an ordinance or within the zoning here? I'm sorry, could you say that, say that part again? Sorry, okay, yeah. So, yeah. And the, the first page of your memo, mm -hmm. the principal permitted uses for the downtown district, there's 11 principal uses. Mm -hmm. So on the, the agreement that entertainment uses should be a principal permitted, permitted use in downtown district, would it just be number 12? Yes. Right, okay. And then yeah. now, the, now the question is, how to break out entertainment uses and define it? I think the question is how to include and define entertainment uses. Okay, so it, it could almost like in the example you have on page two, there's um, from the planning dictionary, there's recreation, commercial, indoor, entertainment, commercial, indoor, and then entertainment establishes. So we could just really take this like deeper with a, more bullet points like 12, 13, 14, whatever on the permitted uses in the downtown district? Yes. So we could add as many examples um, mm -hmm. as we would want. Um, like Aaron said, we would want to include the including but not limited to in case something none of us could ever imagine, um, you know, becomes the next big thing. Okay. And then my last question is, so within that entertainment uses, like the beginning paragraph, like, like you had mentioned, this is from our current ordinance on commercial recreational uses. So, but th that seems like that's in reference to the LB Gateway Coolidge and 12 Mile District. Mm -hmm. Okay, so even if we're talking about specifically the downtown district and defining entertainment uses into however many categories we want, shouldn't it kind of be throughout all the districts and the change be reflective of those as well? Or I think so, Joe, I think that's a, that's a very good point. Like, because the downtown district on the map is just really like three little areas. Um, but I can see that, like if we, ex if we expand the definition of entertainment uses to however many we want, it seems like in, in the Gateway, Coolidge 12 and local business, we would wanna make sure that those are adequately addressed within the, within the uh, principal permitted uses for those areas too, right? I, I agree. Does okay, I agree. agree. Okay. Okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. That's why I just wanted to clear up because it, you know, even though we, I know this initially uh, uh, 
came up about the downtown district, but it sort of seems like it expands just because com from entertainment, well, how, what's the term, sorry, uh, commercial recreational <laughs> is, uh, is allowed other places too, uh, so. Um, I'm sure if I may. So we identified the downtown district specifically because we already have the downtown plan in place for this. Now, our master plan, you know, uh, I have every confidence that they're going to expand the entertainment uses or want to expand those in, in other districts, but there has been discussion about expanding those uses along the 11 mile district. So my question to you is, do you want to do the downtown district now and then look at the rest of the districts when that master plan is complete and so that way we can do all of them at the same time or do the ones that we have in place now knowing that we may have to come back and, and add more or, or change things up a little bit. And I, and I, I defer to your, to what you, you would like to do on that one. So I would be in favor of making sure that we're consistent across the board and doing them all at once. I know that mm -hmm. there's a little bit of time in there. What does the rest of the commission think? Uh, I agree with you. I, I agree with that. Instead of doing them separate or piecemeal, we might as well just do them all together and be done with it. I agree. And I, I don't think there's any, you know, looking at, and the 11 miles brought up, I didn't even think of that until that was just brought up, but, you know, looking at these four five, six districts, you know, th there's probably nothing in this list or these lists that we'd want to exclude from maybe one or two of them. There may be something, but that's something we may want to look at. Um, but I, I think they, they, in general, would all fit in any one of those districts, the uses. I agree with that. And I mean, on that, if we're changing principal permitted uses in um, our downtown or, or wherever, I would also like to talk about at the same time dealing with the um, outdoor patio stuff and so that we don't have to have two separate hearings as to changing something from a special use, you know, what we're allowing for principal use. That makes sense. And, and another thing here, if you look at the list, there's a, a, a matter of scale of some of these things. When you read, you know, art gallery or studio, uh, blah, 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 compared to arena, arena could be hugely larger than uh, uh, than what we may envision as an art gallery. Now, you know, I don't know what arena means. It's not, you know, um, it even, even get into conference center, gymnasiums are large. I don't know if there's something we need to consider uh, as far as uh, the scale of some of these, these um, I we definitely don't want an arena that wipes out, you know, five or 10% of the, the, the residences along 11 mile or something. We're not looking for that at all, I don't think. But uh, we may want to look at this list and think about it in terms of scale of what some of these items are also. That's a good point, Marty. I don't think we can accommodate an arena or a conference center. But a conference, you know, uh, um, um, arenas could be considered a conference center. That's true. You know? But, but uh, and we're losing that, our conference center. So, but again, it's just a matter of maybe, you know, large, you know, small to large, and I don't think we have to rank them in any order, but there may be some things here that just don't, we know the bowling alley is large, especially ours. Um, uh, so anyway, I, ju I just want to bring that up, that there's a, there's a, there's a quite a difference in scale of these, these, these functions as, uh, that are listed here. When I look at the the three definition languages, I kind of feel like what I'd like to see is some mix between the first one and the third one. I feel like the first one, I don't just want like a straight list. So we feel like, you know, I want kind of a definition and then some examples and kind of like an example of kind of main ideas, right? A studio or, you know, um, But so, works. Lisa, maybe the third definition, but with more examples on what's included. Yes. I agree. I think that the third definition is, is general enough that it doesn't exclude anything, but it would be nice to 
to expound on it a little bit. And are we comfortable with entertainment uses or entertainment establishments as the uh, catch-all uh, for how they're they're termed, or do we want to look at that in a different way? Well, you have several things here. You have, you know, entertainment is one thing. Recreation, as in sports, you know, swimming, tennis, skating. And who knows yeah. what might get built. You also have the artistic items, uh, yeah. movie and that's theater, why I included. museum. Mm -hmm. um, and you could even throw the, you know, instrumental music. I mean, things here. And you have assembly. Now, these are all kind of assemblies because you're asking people to come here. There may be a better way to group them or list, or maybe they're just random and, you know, go. But I think entertainment and establishment, which could be all encompassing, recreation, entertainment artistic or assembly, however we want to word it, we could probably do it all in one. I don't think we want to try to nitpick three or four different categories. Might be um, might be best just to include them all in one, but they are different. I mean, you look at this list, there's stuff here that are all completely different in, in many, many ways. So maybe the way to think of it is, do they all have the same type of impact? Well, that's where I got with the large thing. That's a huge yeah. impact. And, you know, maybe parking is an impact like everything else in town uh, uh, where you have a big, uh, a, a large, a large function where a lot of people are leaving at the same time, as opposed to people who come and go, you know, as a nightclub or a dancing or whatever it might be. So um, that may come into play. Is there, is there any reason why we wouldn't want to create at least a minimum of like two or three and kind of look at the scale like Marty mentioned, the impact like Kristen, you mentioned, um, whether it be parking, hours of operation, um, I don't know, I'm, you know, it, it seems like those would be logical things just to step through to make sure that like like items are are like items under the use. Um, I don't know if that gains us anything. Like if it bullet number 12 is just all encompassing of all of these, is, is there a particular reason why we would want to parse them out separately? Um, uh, I guess uh, that's the question I also think about. On that note, um, uh, as, as matters stand now with the same uh, square retail foot uh, requirement, uh, apply to each uh, different kind of activity or business uh, for purposes of, of, of calculating the parking requirement. Um, is that realistic? Uh, you know, if it's a, a concert venue, you're going to need more parking than, than a, you know, a painting venue, I would think. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Each one of these you can find through you know sample codes or or uh, you know or Aaron you can help me here but these all have different parking requirements by square foot or seats or 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 whatever. So we talked about redoing the parking, all of it, right? At some point, not. Um, but I, I agree. If we add some of these things in, and you theoretically you have the indoor tennis club, is going to have a lot different requirement, like. Mark was saying, than a concert venue. Mm -hmm. um, do, do we, I, I hate to do this, but do we want to wait until the parking, we can match the two up so that we're not adding in uses or considering uses that we don't address in the parking ordinance? I feel like that might be too long, though. It could be, yeah. Aaron, what do you, do you have any feedback on that? I understand where you're where you're coming from, uh, Madam Chair, because they do they go, do go in line, and 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 this would be something we'd have to look at together. Um, however, I, I do know that there are some uh, interested business owners who have expressed interest in these types of entertainment uses, and given the fact that the parking may not be done for quite some time, I, I'd hate you know you know next week it'll be done next week it's fine. Um, I I would be concerned about making people wait too long mm -hmm. for for something. 
I, I, I agree. If we have people who are interested and ready to do this, I don't want to hold them up so we can do a wholesale review of every parking standard in the city. Yeah. So theoretically, if we did have a painting with a twist come in, how would they be able to calculate their parking right now? What would they use? Well, how did Artisipate calculate their parking? That's that similar. Was, that's a similar. That it's almost the exact same thing, actually. Yeah, that was that was before me. I'd have to go back and look at what what they did, um, but uh, something like that we could look at the the retail, um, a, a strictly retail space is one parking space per two hundred twenty five square feet of usable floor area. Uh, the usable floor area is seventy percent of the gross, so that would be a um, that would be kind of where I would that would be where I would start. Uh, this mark again is it, it, I have no idea what kind of businesses that are under contemplation. I don't even think I want to know right now. Mm -hmm. I, I'm just um, wondering if we're going to find ourselves between a rock and a hard place when it comes to calculating parking uh, for all different kinds of activities like this. If we don't have a a, a standard right in the um, in the code. Well, I, I mean, you know, whatever, I'll accept whatever answer you've got to that, but I, it's crossing my mind. And, and to that end, um, for the downtown district, any business or property that's located within 500 feet of a municipal lot is exempt from providing on-site parking. Mm -hmm. So technically any business that goes into the downtown district is exempt from, from providing their own on-street parking. So whether it's one per 20, 220. Now, we, we would have to get into that if we expand it to the Coolidge, the local business, the Woodward districts, but um, strictly speaking for the, for the downtown, they are exempt from providing their own, their own site parking. And is that, is the downtown district the spaces where we have some current interest in this? It's just that district? Yes. Okay. Yeah, just, just for probably realize a lot of these are more more assembly uses than they are commercial uses, although there's, well, they can both be, they can be both, but commercial as in a, as in a retail sense, or even one of these little painting with a twist type places, that's, or, you know, a dance, a dance lesson facility, they're completely different than some of these other things when we start talking about, you know, arena, conference center, uh, and things like that, but the parking requirements are wholly different too. So the advantage would be of just adding it to the downtown district now is we don't have to tackle the parking yet. Correct. Could be, yep. But we would take, you know, anything that we would put under this umbrella of the entertainment uses would exclude something, uh, as Commissioner Smith said, you know, in the arena, the auditorium, things that would, um, overpower the existing municipal parking right um you know the the spaces you know and the properties down there aren't big enough for those types of uh uses anyway so those wouldn't be something i would uh i would include in this definition these were all from the planner's dictionary and these were all just uh mm -hmm. just ideas uh to get to get our conversation started so based on the conversation you've heard so far then aaron i mean it sounds like we're we're mostly in agreement on a general definition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'd originally talked and I, I, I still think it's cleanest to address all of this at once with all of the different districts um, at one time. However, it's a lot more challenging than if we have to, to talk about looking at parking standards and I don't wanna hold up any potential businesses because we're dealing with this in other districts. What is the thought of the rest of the commission on that? I, I know we said generally we'd like to do it all at once, but hearing that we have potential businesses who could benefit from a small tweak to the ordinance um, now, instead of embarking on something that's gonna take a little bit more time, what do you guys think? That makes sense. Yeah, if we can hook, if we can hook somebody in, you know, the, the, the easy way. <laughs> uh, I don't have any objection to that. I mean, you know, there's no one set way to go. You have to be responsive to the circumstances. So, so are you saying with it. just approve it 
for downtown for right now and then go back to the other areas. Is that, okay. Yeah. I, th I think that's a good idea. And, and is this as simple as putting a number 12 there and putting entertainment uses and then putting a parentheses and just listing entertainment uses? Is yeah, that, it could be that. that we might want to add something to the definition section too, but yes, it's pretty much that simple. Could be that simple. So my question there is, is it really, I mean, for what we're thinking that we're going to add for this is, are we going to be introducing uses that we really have no idea what we would ask for parking for them for? I mean, is that really a big issue as far as making it across the board? So if I think Lisa, if we're talking about like escape rooms or painting studios or things like that, I, I think that they're parking needs would be similar to some of the commercial indoor recreation uses that we already have listed. Um, if we were talking about some like a, you know, like a, a venue for bands to play or something that's yeah, that's going to be something totally different. So I don't think we would want to in the in the definition, or in the including but not limited to uses include anything that that would exceed any parking capacity, which is I think what you said right Aaron. Mm -hmm. So once you once we came back or you came back with the the suggested language, I, I think that you're right, Lisa. We would have to think about each one that's listed and be comfortable with the fact that our parking could theoretically handle those because they're similar to things that might already be included. Does that make sense? Maybe yeah. So and I not to give you a ton more work, Erin, but maybe I mean, because I, I would love to have it across the board, like make it a very simple definition and have it be across the board. So maybe when you come back, I mean, if it's not asking too much, kind of like go, you know, for this use, you know, we have something or, you know, if there's any conflict areas from whatever ones you're listing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The the only other the only other question I have with focusing just on the downtown district and setting up definitions now, <clears throat> is there anything that like doesn't fit that is an entertainment but doesn't fit with that district? Like, I mean, just throwing it out there, like this indoor archery range is listed. So is that something that seems I'm thinking gun range, archery range, like if those are considered commercial recreation uses and we open up a definition for this, is that, is that a good thing to have in the downtown district? Like, is it, are we being very prescriptive with the uses or really open-ended for the downtown district? So I think that's a really good point, um, Joe. Because that's, and that's kind of what I was saying. And I think Marty, you said it too. A lot of these uses yeah. are very different from one another. I think in our including but not limited to list, we would want to stick more to the entertainment type uses and not necessarily list out tennis clubs and indoor archery ranges and conference centers. Okay. Yeah. And I'm thinking not, not just, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I, and I'm not thinking just because of the parking or the scale. I'm thinking also because of the actual use, mm -hmm. <laughs> like um, ju just if it's not to the character of what it should be there. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. Okay, Erin, does that give you enough direction for right now? It does, yes. Good. So I'll bring back this item next month um, with uh, some, some cleaned up language and um, look at how we can, uh, maybe some parking suggestions, certainly not what we're going to be doing, but if we were to be including these in the Coolidge 11 mile district, how that could be comparable. Would that work for you, Ms. Kempner? Yes, yes that, that works. Okay, yes. We're good. And there's no one that wanted to comment on this from the public, correct? I don't see any hands raised or emails, no. Okay. Okay, so we have one other discussion item, state licensed residential facilities. So what do we have to consider for this? Okay, so um, 
I have included my April 20th, 2021 review letter. Um, so this comes to you because we have recently um, received some inquiries um, from the public to open in-home daycare centers. Um, these have previously been looked at uh, as a home and regulated as a home occupation, which is not regulated. Um, by, by definition, which I include here, it's an occupation or profession customarily carried on by an occupant of the dwelling unit as a secondary use, which is clearly incidental to the use of the dwelling unit for residential purposes. There shall be no exterior display other than one non-illuminated nameplate, which is not more than two square feet in area, which may be attached to the building. No stock and trade commodities sold. And then it stipulates nursing homes, tea rooms, tourist homes, beauty parlors, retail business or trade shall not be considered home occupations. So in that, in, in the single family residential districts, um, any type of home occupation does not require any kind of um, uh, planning commission, city council, or any other approvals. Um, however, it does state that nursery schools, day nurseries, and child centers do require special land use approval. However, based on the site regulations and um, when we went through for the office districts uh, last two years ago, um, these are um, mainly speaking to commercial facilities. So anything more than uh, 13 children where they're, um, they have multiple rooms, they have lots of children and they have a, a large area um, to accommodate. Now there are two acts that regulate uh, nursery schools, day nursery and child care centers um, and child care homes, the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act, which references the Child Care Organizations Act uh, from 1973. And I've included this in your, in your packet. So it gives definitions for what a child care center is uh, mainly a facility other than a private residence. So that's where um, the child care center is not deemed to be um, as part of a residence. It is a facility, um, a family child care home, and a group child care home. And this is where um, um, we're looking to you for, for a discussion. So uh, I noted here that there are no um, uh, in, ch in home child care providers licensed by Laura in the community. Um, when I looked uh, at this, there wasn't, but uh, under further uh, review, um, there are four um, in our community, three of which are, um, or, I'm sorry, there are four child care centers, three of which are located in elementary schools. One is Teachable Moments, which is located on 12 Mile, and there are three others which are considered to be in-home child care facilities. Uh, one has uh, capacity of six, up to six children and the other one has a capacity up to 12. So I apologize. Are those, for that, uh, that are those in residential areas? Yes. Okay. And those are licensed with Lara. Um, yeah, because these so, are highly regulated. These are highly licensed. Highly yes, regulated. they are. Yeah. Yes, they are. Um, the, 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 I'm sorry, the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act does allow for cities and um, villages to regulate in-home child care and other state residential facilities. Um, anything up to six children uh, should be permitted by right. Anything over six, so seven to 12 children, the city has the option to require special land use approval. Um, so like I said, this was intended to get ahead of, of, of big issues. And I, I, I don't foresee that becoming, becoming a, a huge issue, but uh, I wanted to provide information to you so we could have this discussion um, while we were aware of it. And I did include the regulations from a number of other communities. And like I said, this encompasses all state licensed residential facilities. This is not exclusively to the in-home in child care. This includes adult foster care, foster care homes, family care homes, um, things of that nature. So, um, but it's all under that umbrella of the state licensed residential facility. So I have included the regulations from the city of Clawson, Rochester Hills, um, scrolling down, Huntington Woods, and Oak Park. Um, so there's a lot here to, to go through and to, to digest. And I, I, I know this is the first time that this has come, come before you. So this is a lot of information at once. Um, but this is something that um, if we want to begin regulating it outside of a home occupation, this would be where we would start. Um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you have. So right off the bat, mm -hmm. just to backtrack a bit, um, 
we've been getting some, what, what, can you tell me again what precipitated this? Are there complaints from neighbors that are near these homes or is it just that people have been inquiring and it's like, oh, we don't really have anything on this? Right, yeah. So um, I had, you know, I've had a couple inquiries here and there and it was just uh, a uh, home regulated as a home occupation. Um, so there really wasn't anything here. And as we were looking into it a little bit more um, before it becomes, and I was saying it would, but um, before it becomes one on every street, is this something we want to, to look at? Um, so it's my understanding from state law that the family daycare homes, up to six children, mm -hmm. have to be principal permitted uses. Yes. Is that right? That's right. And that would apply to group homes, up to six adults, et cetera. Yes. So we have the ability to make seven to 12 mm -hmm. special land use. Yes. And put things like, distance requirements cannot be within so many feet of another licensed facility for seven to 12 residents. Correct. Yeah, and screening measures and, and things of that, making sure they have a sufficient outdoor outdoor space for, for recreation, yes. So I, I know Marty said that this is highly regulated by the state. So I, I do think they get into things, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, Marty, for the state in terms of how much outdoor recreation space you need for kids and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah and that in some of these uh, she you know uh, Aaron handed us some uh, things by from I guess it's Clawson Rochester Hills so on and so forth and if you read through them they're very confusing uh, unless you put them all side by side they, they're almost mirrors of each other because these are the regulations and they get into 150 square feet or whatever, whatever per child or whatever it is. So, um, but, and Aaron, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, these are so similar because that's what the state requires. Yes. Yes, okay. So my concern with getting into some of these specifics that are listing more or less what the state requires is if the state regulations change and we don't keep up to date with those regulations, then our ordinance is in conflict with the state requirements and really becomes obsolete unless we require more than the state does. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't have a problem, you know, looking into some of this, I think, and, and putting some regulations or making some of these special land uses, but I don't think I would want to get into the specifics of of laying out things that the state already takes care of. I think that's a duplication of efforts unless we have specific concerns um, about screening or, or distancing or something like that. Um, so uh, I have a question here. Does the state law um, have anything to say about local regulations? Some laws preclude local communities from enacting uh, more or less stringent regulations than the state reg regulations and the state regulations are exclusive. It is, right. is what's the case with these, uh, these kinds of regulations, do, do we know? Well, the, the state allows, allows and requires up to six children in an in-home daycare facility to be a principal permitted use. Anything beyond that, seven to 12, they allow for the local municipality to require a special land use if they so deem fit. Um, uh, there are there are requirements with you know compatibility with the um, with the neighborhood. You can require screening. You have to require um, some type of uh, outdoor area for them uh, to play, um, pick up and drop off hours of operation. That's all. Um, that's part of it, and that's part of the special land use re uh, review. Well, what I'm what I'm asking is, uh, can can Berkeley go beyond uh, state requirements pertaining to minimum number of feet per child, uh, uh, type and, and and location and size of fencing uh, uh, and so forth? Uh, you know, I, 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 what I'm trying to do is understand whether there's any point in 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 Berkeley regulating these uses any more so than than we have. I mean, do we have concerns going over and above what the state requirements cover? And, and you know, it may not be possible legally to, um, 
you know, to enact more stringent requirements too. There are a lot of laws like that. I'm, I'm not sure this one is or not, but uh, it's worth, that, that, that's something to consider. This would all be vetted through the, the city attorney's office and, and certainly I wasn't, wouldn't be suggesting anything that would require um, anything more above and beyond what the, the state is requiring. Okay. So to Mark's point then, um, we have the ability to take um, child care for seven to 12 residents and group home facilities for seven to 12 residents and make them special land uses. And we can add additional conditions to those, you know, as we're permitted by state law. We haven't had any complaints on any, um, right, not that we're aware of any complaints on any of these uses. Have, did you do um, a search, Erin, to see not just the child care, but group homes that are registered within the city? The, the in-home child care? Not the child care. Well, adult um, foster, say, say, are you implying adult foster care? Yep, or adult group homes. Right. No, I did not. Okay. So I'm guessing there's some here. I would be shocked if there aren't. Um, so the first question of the commission then is whether or not we want to make um, child care for seven to 12 and, and group homes for seven to 12 a special land use. Well, let me ask a, a, a question, Aaron. For one to six children, is that considered a home occupation? That would, I mean, to a certain degree, yeah. I mean, it's permitted, it's it's required to be permitted by right in a single family residential district. So in that sense, it would be considered, it could be considered a home occupation. And that's how these have been regulated, whether it's one child or 12 children, these all have been regulated under the umbrella of the home occupation. Okay. I wasn't aware of that, so okay. And, and that's, this is also in-home daycare, so it's regardless of age, right? Okay. Yes. No. Well, in-home in-home child daycares are, you know, they have age limits. But so it could what, be adult daycare and other things too. What yes, I'm driving yeah. at is, do we have the authority to um, prohibit uh, the the larger? Uh, homes and the larger uses it doesn't sound like it no we don't have the authority to do it but we have the authority to make them special land uses and to attach conditions like distancing requirements and screening well, that, that. well that's that's was also my question those the state has comprehensive regulations about screening and distancing and so on i believe and can we vary the, can we vary those requirements i i don't understand if we can or not i don't well, I, yeah, I the think state, that'd be a slippery slope. I don't think the area. state has distancing requirements. Um, There's some in these, and I don't know, I don't recall what they refer, which which type of care they refer to, but there are some buried in here somewhere. Yeah, so. Matt, did you have something that you want? Yeah, I got a few statements about this. Well, first off, I have a very, very good knowledge of in-home daycares. Um, as far as daycares, it's fine. They're just daycares. The people are there during the day and then they leave. It's the adult foster cares that I have some good knowledge of because I have in-laws that used to run one out of their house. Now, I will say the torment to the neighbors was not pleasant. The people who were living there were not very pleasant. And I feel that the people that live around an adult foster care house should know what's going on there. Um, when you have a situation like that with people with close head injuries, drug injuries, drug issues, there's a lot of things that happen around that house that do cause a lot of problems for the neighbors. Um, I think it should be highly regulated for the adult foster care specifically. As far as the daycare, the people come in in the morning, they leave in the afternoon, that's not a problem. But it's a 24-7 operation that causes a lot of problems. Um, as far as the state regulations, Laura does regulate everything in regards to those houses. But the problems happen after you know, the people that are there and they go home and they go to bed at night, the adults that are in foster care kind of run, the, you know, run wild at night and do some really, really crazy things. So I, I think some regulations need to be put into place. I would not recommend an adult foster care for anything over six people because I've seen what happens once you get more than six people. Um, and this is from personal experience. 
And I, I, I would highly recommend no adult foster care is over 24 hours over six people because it's just going to be a nightmare for the neighbors. So Matt, we have to, by state law, allow seven to 12 as a special use. Okay. That's as far as we could go with a, you know, limit, a limit. Mm -hmm. But we could, we could attach conditions. I, I would make some very, very stringent standards. And I would make it also an approval by the neighbors to have this happen because they're the ones going to pay a serious price. Their cars are going to be destroyed. Their properties next door. That they're going to wake up in the morning and see people sitting on their front lawn or in their front patio. There's going to be some things that happen that the neighbors are not going to appreciate. I need uh, the city attorney to tell me we've got the authority to actually do those things. I'm not at all convinced right now. We, we can control any of that, but mm -hmm. spot, I don't know the law in this area, so I don't know, but it, we need to find out, I'd say. Well, well the city attorney, I mean, Aaron, Aaron's going to have to talk to the city attorney about this anyways, but if we can make a more stringent standard. I mean, the daycares are the daycares. That's not that difficult, but it's a 24-hour service that creates some problems. So maybe the first question we have is we need to know what we are allowed to regulate from the city attorney. I, I know you can regulate distancing and I know you can regulate things like screening, but what else are we allowed to comment on and add conditions for? Yeah, and, and for just to limit things to main roads could, so I think those are the types of things we probably need to know before we can weigh in on what would be appropriate. I think it should, um, just to further Matt's point, I mean, really, Kristen, your, your initial question is the special permitted uses. I mean, it should be for the child care too, even if it's just daycare, because I mean, who would want to be sandwiched if you're working from home between two homes that have 12 kids each? Like that could be an issue for someone that's the neighbor in between. Um, you know, I, I it, the one through six sounds like you know, there's really no choice, but like definitely the special, like both of these sort of situations should, we should look at. And, and I don't think one is really worse than the other ultimately. You know, I mean, there's, 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 there's different um, scales, <laughs> I guess on that, so. Yeah, I agree. I think if we're gonna make one a special land use, we should make both. I, I can speak on the child care facilities. My kids grew up in an in-home child care facility and two different ones. And in general, the people there don't create too many problems with the neighbors. They're very quiet. The kids play in the backyard. I mean, it's no different than what goes on in my backyard when I have nine little boys or little girls running around my backyard with all my with all their friends. It's no different, but it's the child care is not that big of an issue. It's when you get to the 24-7 operation, I think that really impacts the community. Yeah, I guess the only way I'm thinking it's different is it is a business. So you know, it's, it's an ex service being exchanged for money. So anytime that's involved, even if it's just kids during the day, you know, there could be issues. <laughs> the only issue I ever ran into is parking. Hmm. Yeah, I, I live by a school, so parking is always an issue by me. <laughs> There's always yeah. teachers and parents park everywhere in front of my house. So <laughs> uh -huh. It's probably me one day, most of the time. So I feel conflicted as to like whether we, you know, take this on or or not because it hasn't been a problem. However, there's another part of me that says I'd like to have something on the books. So if conflicts arise between neighbors, there's like clear cut things you can point to that says, you know, look, they've done all this stuff that we say they have to do, so they're fine. I, I think we're all trying to head down a path that none of us know a whole lot about. Um, would it be best to have the city attorney or somebody do a presentation for us of what's allowed and or what's mandatory yeah. law and everything else before we even, you know, we're just speculating here. And, you know, I know a little bit about it. A couple of you folks know a little bit about it, but I am no expert and nobody, I, th I think from what I hear, nobody is. And yeah. we really should have someone uh, 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 set it out for us so we know what we're looking at. What's our level of discretion? That's that's what I am yeah. want to know. And if I may, these were all things that I have on my list of, of continuing on the next step of discussion. It was a matter if we wanted to continue moving forward uh, 
into this path. It sounds like it sounds like we do. Yeah. I think it's quite unusual that we don't have this regulated. I, I guess I haven't seen a lot of zoning ordinances out there that don't address this. So it seems like it makes sense. Yes. Yeah, but I, think I would agree. Right. I think some information or even a presentation would be would be better by the city attorney. I mean, this isn't a big time crunch, right? We don't have any complaints on the books, but it makes sense probably to to put something in there should any issues arise. I think Kristen's right. I mean, this isn't uh, this isn't a situation where they'll just act like it doesn't happen because it does happen. And we, we should update our ordinance to address it. But we need to know what we're, we need to update it to first, I think. Great. All set then, Aaron, for that one? Okay. So speaking of updates, we also have an updated 2021 calendar with some work sessions. I'm assuming to finalize the master plan. Yes, and uh, I apologize, this is, this is my my night, but uh, um, I after this was published, I spoke with Megan, and the uh, master plan won't be ready for the May fourth work session. So I mean, we can still meet and discuss about things uh, next week if you like, but um, that one's not necessarily going to be going to be needed because there won't be any uh, master plan to to look over. The plan Star is Wars to give that to you later later this month. I'm sorry. Star Wars Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can meet for happy hour if you want. There you go. Um, but yes, these were these were uh, included to uh, facilitate the the final the final finaling of the master plan document. So, if we're not going to do May the fourth, do we need to tack a third one on after August. maybe July then, or no, we won't need that. Early I don't think August. we need that hopefully the plan is to have that all finalized by then. And so then it will go for public comment and then the public hearing, all of those will have to be done at the, the formal meetings, uh, the regular meetings, not, uh, not any more work sessions. So um, these were included if, if we needed to go back and do some, some tweaking and heavy lifting, but uh, for the most part, it's not, uh, um, a lot of that has been, has been done already. So I don't Aaron? think we need to oh. add, add another one into, uh, into August. No. Okay, Aaron, when might, might we expect to get a draft of a master plan to look at? Just so I can put in my busy schedule. Right, right. well, um, the plan is hopefully maybe next week. I've got, a, I've got a conference call with Megan tomorrow to go over everything. So, I mean, they've been, they've been writing like crazy over the last couple of days. Uh, it just wasn't gonna be ready for, for the work session next. Well, it wasn't gonna be ready to, to give you enough time to digest the entire document before, before we needed to discuss it fully. So okay. uh, it was better to, to wait a couple more weeks rather than wait a whole nother month of, of, of waiting two weeks. So, so we, can uh, expect a, we can expect a draft maybe next week. I think she said, the last time we talked, I think she said the beginning of May. So I would expect next week. <laughs> Okay. If not, I will I will reach out to all of you with uh, with a final date if it's not going to be ready. That's fine. Just you can throw a maybe on top of all that. That's fine. So you need a motion from us to adopt this amended calendar with the exclusion of May fourth, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I move to adopt this amended calendar with the exclusion of May fourth. I support Lisa's motion. <laughs> Aaron, could you call the roll? I'm sorry. Um, Smith. Yes. Stern. Yes. Trotto. Yeah. Bardis. Yes. Dolan. Yes. Kempner. Yes. Patterson. Yes. Richardson. Yes. Kapolanski. Yes. Okay, so we're at the end of the agenda pretty much now. We have liaison reports. And why don't we just wrap that in with commissioner and staff comments? So does anyone have anything that they would like to report? I did attend the DBA meeting. It was mostly talk about uh, the budget. It was really all it was. It was important. Thanks, Matt. Oh, they did talk about the crosswalks again. They're still trying to get the crosswalks and the coolage taken care of. 
Thank you. That's good to hear. Anyone else have anything to report? Nothing from environmental. <laughs> okay. And no other motion comments? to adjourn. What I, ask a I have a question. Yeah. Does anybody know if they're going to have the uh, cruise fest this year? Oh, I don't know. The plan is still yes to have the cruise fest. Yes. That's a good sign. Yes. We're very excited about that one. Okay. So I don't have anything else. Aaron or Matt, do you have anything else? Nothing? Uh, I already gave you the update about the master plan. So look for that in the in the coming week. Um, oh, one more thing, Aaron. Hey, I asked about ongoing education. Did you have anything else pop up for ongoing education? Uh, there is a webinar every, well, I think this is the last, uh, every Wednesday, there's been a six part series on resilience and planning, resiliency and planning. So that's been the last couple of Wednesdays from 8.30 to 10, they're about an hour and a half a piece. A lot of really good information. Um, mm -hmm. I will check, I will verify the dates and I'll send that to you this evening. I think I think that series was done last week, Aaron. Was it done last week? Okay, there were six of them and I can't remember if we were on fire. Now it doesn't mean, I didn't look it up yet, but it doesn't mean that they won't have them, uh, you know, archived that you can go back and watch them. So I haven't mm -hmm. looked that up, but. They were, and they had a lot of good information in them. Okay. Yeah, they were, they were very interesting. So I'll look into that and, and see if I can get to the, send the recorded copies to everybody. Um, okay. there, there are a couple of other things I'll send, I'll uh, forward those emails to you again, Matt. Okay. Is the APA still doing the free Tuesday for the APA recordings? As far as I know. Okay, so that's out there too then. And I know the Michigan Historic Preservation Network Conference is virtual and it's coming up too. It's really low cost. I don't know if that would count towards continuing education. I know that it's available for AICP credits, so. Okay, um, yeah, we'll look into that and yeah, for sure, thank you. Okay, any motions to adjourn then? Motion to adjourn. For a second. Aaron, could you call the roll? Uh, Stern? Yes. Trotto? Yes. Bardis? Yes. Stalin? Yes. Kempner? Yes. Patterson? Yes. Richardson? Yes. Smith? Yes. Kapolanski? Yes. Okay, everyone, we will see you next month. Everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.